You know, it's interesting when we meet someone, one of the first things we often ask, what do you do? Well, I'm a businessman, I'm a student, I'm a pastor, I'm a financial planner. Well, that's what you do. Who are you? And, and often we, we get our identity, do we not, from what we do instead of who we are in Christ. I want to tell you today, nothing is more true about you than what God Almighty says about you. Nothing is more true about you than what your Creator says about you. And I want you to repeat after me. God is who He says He is. He will do what He says He will do. I am who He says I am. I have all that He says I have. I can do all that He says I can do. Turn please to 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll read the scripture, I'll pray, then our children ages 3 years through 5th grade that want to go to the Gospel Project time will be dismissed after this. So let's stand together. 1 Peter 2, beginning at verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray today uh, what Paul prayed in Ephesians 1 because he saw that it was so necessary for the believers of that day and it's so necessary for us today that you would open the eyes of our heart that we might grasp the hope of our calling, the riches of your inheritance in the saints, and the surpassing greatness of your power toward us who believe, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. God, would you give us revelation knowledge today that would go deep to our knower, way beyond our head, but to our heart and that we would be encouraged and transformed. I pray for every person here today who has yet to cross the line of faith. They're not in Christ, that they will see what they can become if they come in Christ. And I pray for those today who are in Christ, that they will recognize what it means to be in Christ and to have Christ in them. God, would you give an amazing revelation today that will set us free to serve you with joy and fruitfulness that the nations might know that Jesus is Lord. In His name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Children, ages three years to fifth grade, you are dismissed that want to go to the Gospel Project time. rest of you, take out your notes. It's going to be uh, a major phrase from 1 Peter 2. Then there will be a point that explains what that means. We're, we're saving the bulk of our musical worship for after the message today because it's going to be a follow-up to what we learn in the Word. So sometimes the, the bulk of our musical worship is, is before the message, and sometimes if we feel that it is more appropriate to follow the truth of God's Word, then we save it for that time, and that's what we're doing today. On January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And what that did is it legally set free slaves in the United States. However, many slaves, despite the Emancipation Proclamation, continued to live in slavery. Some out of ignorance, they did not know what had just occurred. Others out of fear, they, did not, they weren't willing to take the risk of stepping out, and it was a big risk, stepping out and, and really laying hold of their freedom. And still other slaves uh, were so comfortable in their slavery and having things provided, which was understandable, they were unwilling to really go out of their slavery. I submit to you today, church, that many Christians are exactly like that illustration. Jesus Christ has issued an emancipation proclamation 
when He died on the cross, rose from the dead, died in our place for our sins, bearing the wrath of God, so that you and I could be set free from the flesh, from sin, and from Satan. And yet many of us live in slavery because we either are ignorant of what we have in Christ and who we are in Christ, or we're fearful to step out and really claim what God has given us, or we're so comfortable in our spiritual mediocrity that we do not embrace that which has been given us in Jesus Christ. Today's going to change that. (laughs) Today is going to change that in your life. Because you're going to receive truth from God about yourself if you're in Christ. And you're going to be open to the Holy Spirit today. And the Holy Spirit of the living God is going to take that seed of His Word and He's going to plant it deep in your spirit. And He's going to give you revelation knowledge today. And you're going to have at least one light bulb that's going to come on in your spirit today. Because the Spirit of God wants to do that today. And I prayed that and I believe He's going to do it. You're going to get a phrase. You're going to get a word. You're going to, you're going to get a, a picture in your mind. You're going to get something in this message is going to so Velcro to your spirit today that you're going to leave here and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you're going to look back and say, something's changed. Something's different. God did something there. And some of you, years from now, are going to look back on today and you're going to say, I have never been the same because of what happened that day. Or you're going to take that little bookmark that you got today and you're going to begin to, to meditate and recite and proclaim the truth of who you are, and you're going to see a difference in your emotions. You're going to see a difference in your behavior. You're going to see a difference in your relationships. You're going to see a difference in your motivation because the truth of who you are is going to begin to just pour out of your heart and life. Do you believe that today? Well, I do, and I'm excited about what God's going to do in this place in the next 30 minutes. I really am. This series, Ignite the Fire, is basically messages that, that, um, that I have found to be the most impactful on me and others in living a fruitful and victorious and joyful life. And today is a huge one for me because for the first few years of my journey with Christ, I lived what you could call a very performance-oriented Christian life where I felt that I had to earn God's love and acceptance by my behavior. And then God began to, to, to show me these truths and the power of that house diagram that I gave you a few weeks ago where the foundation is who God is. And then the door into the house is the person and the work of Jesus. And then it's who we are in Christ, including in that the filling of the Holy Spirit. And that all drives the top of the house, which is our behavior. And so it's important to recognize today that who we are in Christ, that's our focus today, that the, 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 the foundation for that truth and those truths, because there's a lot of them. Matter of fact, this summer, I'm excited about this. This summer, our discipleship hour, we usually take a break from the children's ministry and the youth ministry during the summer, during that 9 a.m. time. And last summer, we had one class for adults, and it was focused on the attributes of God. And every week, we took a different attribute of God. Well, this summer, it's going to be on who we are in Christ. So for about 10, 12 weeks, each week's going to hit on a different aspect of our identity in Christ. And different people in the church are going to be teaching each week. It's going to be awesome. The foundation for this is who God is. And if you read 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2, you learn a lot about who God is. That He's eternal. That He's sovereign. That He's an initiating God. That He's a father who wants children. (laughs) And that He's a father who loves a family with children who want to spend time with Him and be with Him. We learn that He's holy. That He takes the initiative to send His Son Jesus to be the sin barrier for you and me. To bridge the gap that separates us from God. And so then you begin to see who is Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's God in flesh. He's the Redeemer. He's the Justifier. He died in my place for my sin. And you see throughout 1 Peter 1 and 2 the the word cornerstone is used three four times that he's the cornerstone he's the rock he's the basis for everything that I have and so it's crucial today that you realize that who we are in Christ comes out of a proper understanding of who God is his nature his attributes and what Jesus has done for us at Calvary that all leads to verses 9 and following which says but you are What's that a contrast of? It's a contrast from verse 8 where it says they stumbled because they disobeyed the Word. They didn't believe. Go to verse 7. So the honor is for you who believe, 
If you believe, there's honor for you. You get honored. (laughs) And then it says, but for those who do not believe, so you see that contrast? Believer, unbeliever. Those are biblical terms. An unbeliever is a person who has not placed their faith in Christ alone for their salvation. They've not repented of their sins. They've not trusted Christ alone to be the mediator between them and God. They've not trusted Christ alone to forgive them of their sins. If you're in that category today, I hope today as you hear the truth of who you can become, you'll say, I would be a fool to not embrace Jesus and become those things. And if you're in Christ and you've trusted Christ, you've believed in a biblical sense, I hope today you're encouraged to see some of, and we're just going to touch on this. There's so many other truths about who we are in Christ that aren't even mentioned in this passage. So this is in in some ways just whetting your appetite to go deeper. And so the first one is this. You're a chosen race. That means you're wanted. (laughs) You are wanted by God. Now, every one of these phrases... Peter quotes from a different Old Testament passage. Some of your Bibles have it in italics or in all caps, see, or it's, or it's indented. It, 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 it's many of the study Bibles today, they do something to designate. Look in your Bible, see if it is that way, where, where it's something that kind of sets it apart, and, and you're going, why has it got different letters or different font size? And then many times you'll have a footnote. Well, what's, do you have a footnote on chosen race? Come on. He's quoting from an Old Testament passage. This shows Peter's immense knowledge of Scripture and the Holy Spirit's inspiration, of course. But he's like, I want to remind these people who they are. And he takes a phrase here from Deuteronomy and he takes this phrase from Exodus and he takes this phrase from Leviticus and takes this phrase from Hosea. Woo, we're going to get there. So he's quoting a different Old Testament. Come on, which one is this? Which one? Chosen race. No. You guys do not have good study Bibles or something. What's going on here? Deuteronomy 7. Let's go to Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 to 8. Chosen race. So he pulls from the Old Testament, showing not only his immense biblical knowledge, but also it shows that the covenant establishing God of the Old Testament with the people of Israel is the same covenant establishing God of the New Testament, and we are the new Israel in Jesus. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession. Out of all the people who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set His love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that He swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the land of Pharaoh, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Here's the point. God took the initiative to call us to Himself despite our imperfections. In other words, He chose you to be in Christ not because of anything to do with you. (laughs) It's not because He looked at you and said, oh, they'll make a good Christian. I think I'll redeem them. You ever hear people say that? Man, they would sure make a good Christian. That is about the sorriest theological statement I've ever heard in my life. person that looks good in the flesh is probably going to make a terrible Christian because they'll probably think they can do it on their own. (laughs) The point here is that God calls us. He chooses us all because of Him and nothing because of us. It's not because we're so faithful. It's because He's faithful. It's not because we're so loving. It's because He's so loving. It's not because we're so good. It's because He's so good. Matter of fact, we are dead in our sin. We are enemies of God. We are destined for hell. In our flesh, we go far from God, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. But God, being rich in mercy, though we were dead in sins, made us alive together in Christ, Ephesians 2. Amen? 
Romans 5 and 8 says God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't say, get your act together, then I'll send Jesus. He said, I'm going to send Jesus when you're in the worst of states. Because I love you. And it's all about Him. You're a chosen race. You're wanted. He goes to the orphanage. And He looks out over all those children in the orphanage. And they're all under the control of Satan. They're living in darkness and sin and rebellion. And and God says, I want her. I want him. I'm going to adopt you. That's a biblical phrase. We're adopted. We're adopted, children of God. And so chosen race refers to a people where God initiates the process. God initiated sending His Son. God initiated giving us His Word to reveal our sin in the Gospel. The Holy Spirit convicted us of sin and showed us our need for Jesus. John 6 and 44, no one can come to the Son unless the Father draws Him. You say, well, I chose Jesus. Oh, really? (laughs) Well, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you, John 15, 16. And Ephesians 1 and 4 says He chose us. Here's one. You can put, put this in your pipe and smoke it. Ephesians 1 4. He chose us before the foundation of the earth. Say, so David, that's way too much for me to comprehend. Me too, and I have a doctorate degree. <laughs> that's why I love mystery. Truths about God that you just go, it's, a, it's so amazing I'll never fully comprehend it, but I'm so glad it's true. He chose you before the foundation of the earth of the earth. Ephesians 1.4 1 Peter 1 and 3 it's, it's the verse by which Living Hope Church was named. He caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. Say, I don't understand that. Neither do I. <laughs> he caused us to be born again. He's the beginning of the salvation process. He's the end of the salvation process. The Bible says that He is the author and perfecter of faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Many say it's salvation that's a free gift. Yes, it is. But actually that verse grammatically, it's faith that's the free gift. We are saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. What's the gift? Faith. (laughs) God gave you faith to believe. You are a chosen race You are wanted. Good news, isn't it? Number two. Royal priesthood. This means you're welcomed. You're not only wanted, you're welcomed. This is an interesting phrase. Royal means it's of the highest stature. Royal is very significant. It's beautifully adorned. It's clothed with garments fit for someone very important. We are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Come on. Given divine garments. Priest. The priest was the one who was designated and appointed by God to come into the Holy of Holies in the temple to meet with God to intercede for the people and to offer the sacrifice. That's what the priest did. We have a great high priest who has torn the veil, come through, with his own blood, been the final and perfect sacrifice for our sins, so that we come not to offer a sacrifice for atonement. That's been done. We come offering our lives a living sacrifice. We can come into the Holy of Holies boldly before Almighty God by the blood of Jesus Christ. Royal priesthood means you're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. You have access to the very holiness of Almighty God. You can come in prayer to pour out your heart. To intercede for others. To listen to God. To worship Him, to praise Him, to thank Him. To struggle and wrestle with issues in your life. To come and and bring the kingdom of God from heaven to earth through intercessory prayer. It's there that you bind Satan. It's there that you meet with God. 
It's there that you have your heart refreshed. It's there that you cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. It's there that you're anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. You let your request be made known to God. And you come boldly because of what Jesus did, not what you do. And so the point here is this. God has given us complete access to His presence based on what Christ has done for us. It's not based on you. It's not based on your performance. It's not based on how much of the Bible you read. It's not based on how much you gave to the church. It's not based upon how many acts of charity and goodness you did that week. Your bold, confident access to Almighty God is based upon what Jesus did for you at the cross. He took your sin. He bore the wrath of God. He died in your place for your sin so that you could be forgiven and be a royal priesthood. Hallelujah be to God. And so do you take advantage of that? Or do you let Satan lie to you and say, well, you did this or you did that or look what a sorry this you are. You're a loser or you're that. Yeah. And so God doesn't want you. Yes, He does. And if you will put your focus on the cross and on Jesus and who you are, then you'll come with confidence. It doesn't mean that sin is irrelevant. It doesn't mean that God doesn't look at our behavior. It doesn't mean any of that. Matter of fact, when you get there, here's the deal. When you get in the Holy of Holies, boldly by the blood of Jesus, then you're like, oh God, forgive me for this. And, and God, I, I realize that in this area I wasn't the way you wanted. And Lord, cleanse me afresh and... Just apply that blood over that. and You see? But what we do is we, keep, we allow our sin to keep us from going in. When God says go in, regardless of your behavior, go in based upon the cross, and then when you get in, I'll deal with you there. You see? Go in. Be bold. Be confident. You're a royal priesthood. You're welcomed by your Father. Welcomed by your Father. So where did he quote this phrase? Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Exodus 19, 5 and 6 probably hits royal priesthood and holy nation. Context here is God had delivered His people out of Egypt. They had crossed the Red Sea. They were about to receive the Ten Commandments. I think the picture here of salvation under the New Covenant is powerful. We have been delivered from slavery and sin and Satan. We have crossed the Red Sea, <laughs> the blood of Jesus, see? And, and, and we have been saved. We've been delivered out of slavery. And like the house diagram, before you start talking a lot about what you do, let's, let me make sure they understand who they are. Come on. Who you are should always drive what you do. What you do does not determine who you are. Who you are should motivate what you do. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that shall speak to the people of Israel. It sounds like they've got to obey to, to, to get this, but actually under the new covenant it's very clear, you become this in Christ, then you live it out because in verse 12 of, of 1 Peter 2, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Who you are should motivate what you do. Number three, in Christ we are a holy nation. This means you're clean. So many struggle believing this because our lives are often so unholy. But the bottom line is this is a statement of identity. And I'll explain what it means. A nation is a group of people with something in common. Holy means set apart, pure, righteous. We are a nation. We're the new Israel. We're the church of Jesus Christ. We're a nation. These are all plural statements. This is true of all believers. We, if you're in Christ today, you're a part of a nation called the Church of Jesus Christ. And this statement says you are holy. 
You find, find something in you right now resisting that? Because you're looking at your behavior. God declares you holy. Righteous. Pure. Clean. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on your behalf, that you might become the righteousness of God in Him. Colossians 2 says, He has forgiven us all our sins. Psalm 103 says, He has thrown your sins as far as the east is from the west. Micah says, He has tossed your sins in the depth of the sea. Jeremiah 31 says, He remembers your sins no more. (laughs) Corinthians, Paul is writing to a church that was not behaving as they should. And in the first chapter, he addresses them as saints. Most of the epistles... The early chapters are about who God is and who we are in Christ before giving them admonitions about how they should behave. Paul gave some strong words to the church at Corinth. He addressed the behavior, but he began by reminding them to the saints at Corinth, to the holy ones at Corinth. And they're probably going, what is he on? It's true, believer. If you're in Christ, you are righteous. You are holy. Let me explain in a way that I hope you understand. I've used this before, so for some of you it's a review. The Bible says we are spirit, soul, and body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Now watch that spirit circle as we go to the next slide. In Outside of Christ, you are dead in your transgressions and sins, the Bible says. Yeah, your mind, don't, don't go, let go, keep going back, there we go. So remember, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So your mind and your will and your emotions aren't dead. I mean, you can think, you can act, you can feel, your body's obviously living. So outside of Christ, the only thing that, that would describe true deadness, lostness, is the spirit part of you, which is the deepest part of you, which is the eternal part of you. That's the part when you die that leaves your body. So the truest part of you is what is true of you at the spirit level. You see that? Okay, now, when you come to Christ, watch that inner circle. It goes from dead to holy. That's where you're holy. That's where you're righteous. That's where you're pure and clean. And that's called justification. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Romans 5 and 1. Justified means declared righteous. You see? So then sanctification, the process of living out what is true of justification, next slide, is where what is true in our spirit begins to affect our mind, our will, our emotions, our body. You see that? And then glorification is when you get a new body when you die and go to heaven. So let me show you this in the text. Verse 11. All these statements, I believe, refer to what is true of us at the spirit level. Verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. That's the body. And that's the unredeemed mind, will, and emotions. And then it links it together by saying, which wage war against your soul? Passions of the body will wage war against your soul or your mind, will, and your emotions trying to keep you from experiencing who you really are in Christ. So in other words, live holy because you are holy. Love others because you are loved. Be holy for I am holy, God says. Live out who you are. You're a holy nation. You're pure. You're clean. And here's the statement. God has forgiven us 
all our sins and made us pure in His sight. Neil Anderson, in the book Victory Over the Darkness, says the more you reaffirm who you are in Christ, the more your behavior will begin to reflect your true identity. When I was a young boy in the 60s and 70s, race relations in the South were not so good. My mother taught in an all-black high school in South Carolina. We used to kid her saying, you're the only white thing in that school except chalk. And I was fortunate to have been raised in a family that was very, very compassionate and, and mindful of the needs of African Americans growing up in this country at that time. I remember my dad going down to the Little League Baseball Commission, whatever they called it, in Baseburg, Leesville, South Carolina, and complaining and issuing a formal complaint that they didn't allow blacks to play in the Little League Baseball League. Now, I'll never forget, my mom used to have this little phrase that she would say to us often. Just remember, you had nothing to do with the fact that you were born white. <laughs> so don't ever think that that means that you're better than anybody else. You didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> Good point, huh? And so sometimes at the dinner table, you know, we would share things that we had seen or observed in our little elementary school or middle school. And I remember the phrase that was often used in those situations. Don't you ever treat somebody the way you just talked about seeing treated today because you're a Holt. And Holts don't do that. You're a child of God. You're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. And that's what I think is what he's getting at when he says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from these passions and keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable because of who you are and whose you are. Andy, come on up. I want you, before we hit the last two points, I want you to hear just a real brief testimony from uh, Andy, who has really, I think, seen the truths of, of who we are in Christ have a, have a good impact on his life. Well, you need to hold it. Sorry, because it won't go that high in long term. Uh, Yeah, 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12 in the message says, But you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of the priestly work, chosen to be a holy God, God's instruments to do His work and speak out for Him, to tell others of the night and day differences He made for you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. I became a Christian in July of 1968. For those of you who weren't alive then, it was a time of great tumult in this country. I was 16 and sitting in chapel at a reform school when I became a believer. Fast forward to April of 2014 in the official opening of Living Hope. Julie and I were led of the Lord to leave our church of 25 years and join fellowship with Living Hope. I certainly learned from the men of God I served for the previous 46 years, but it has been in the last two years at Living Hope that I've come to know what my true identity in Christ is. Pastor David recently spoke of Martha and Mary in Luke 10. I began to think about this story and was led to John chapter 11. Here is the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. It was here Jesus told his disciples, it's a good thing for you I wasn't there. Martha came running up to Jesus and told him, if you'd have been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Mary came up and said the same thing. And as I thought about this, I began to realize that when Jesus shows up on the scene, things are different. When there is a problem of any kind and Jesus shows up, things will change. It suddenly dawned on me that where Jesus is, things change. That means 
Where I is, he is, because he is where I is. When I show up in the hospital, a class, a restaurant, a church, or wherever, Jesus is there with me. That changes things. It changes everything. The biggest impact of my newly discovered identity is since I now recognize that I am in him and he is in me, I no longer pray Walmart prayers. Now what is a Walmart prayer? Well, I'm so glad that you asked. It goes like this. Oh Lord, be with us now. Be with the missionaries wherever they are and just be with us now. We know you're someplace else. You're probably over at Walmart, but we need to get you over here. When I realized he said he would never leave or forsake me, I knew that when praying the Walmart prayer, I'm really saying, Lord, I don't believe you. I do want to believe him, and so I no longer pray this next, this kind of prayer. The next step for me is to, per pardon me, the next step for me is to pursue the Lord wherever he leads me and to do whatever he asks me to do. But I have an idea. This subject is so powerful and so important to understand, why don't we see if we can get Pastor David to come up and tell us what he thinks about it? Would you like to do that? Well, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. Awesome. All right. Number four. In Christ, we are people of God. That means we are accepted. This has to do with belonging, fitting in, being in a family. God says you're in His family. God is our Father. We are His children in relationship, in community, with unconditional love and acceptance. John 1 and 12, To as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God. 1 John 3, see how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God, and I love this, and such we are. <laughs> he, he was like he said, they're going to think they're just called it, but it's not really true. So he says, uh, see how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God, and such we are. Now, we really are children of God. Galatians 4, and because we are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, by which we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father, God. You're accepted. Oh, this is amazing. Where does Peter quote now in saying you are not a people, now you are a people, you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy? What book of the Bible? Hosea. It's the next book I'm going to preach through after Ignite the Fire. Turn, if you would, to Hosea, chapter 2, verse 23. It's right after Daniel. The Old Testament. Fascinating that of all the places the Spirit of God would take Peter in articulating truths of who we are, <laughs> he picked Hosea. This is the most radical book in the whole Bible. In the Old Testament. Nothing's more radical than the New Testament. But I mean, this is just crazy, crazy radical. I mean, to me, when I look at stuff like this, it's another piece of powerful evidence that the Bible's the Word of God. Man, I don't care how intelligent, I don't care how much schooling as a prophet or as a scribe or whatever, we would never... <laughs> We would never come up <laughs> with the story that's in Hosea. Hosea 2.23 And I will sow her for myself in the land. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. And the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. Chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom far because 
the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of De blame, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, and on and on it goes. Folks, here's what's happening in the book of Hosea. God commands the prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute. And he tells him in advance, she's not going to be faithful to you. She'll continue to go after other lovers. But you are to remain faithfully devoted to her. Because I am putting on the earth a picture of my love for my people. That I am going to love a people. I'm going to enter into a covenant, chesed, that's the way you pronounce it in the Hebrew, chesed love. Covenant keeping love. That is based entirely on the one making the covenant and not upon the one receiving the covenant. That's chesed love. And so, to demonstrate my love for my people, even though after coming into covenant relationship with me, they will not be faithful, they will commit spiritual adultery, they will go wayward, but I'm going to remain committed to loving them. Beloved, that's the picture Peter gives in calling us a people of God. So here's the point. God welcomes us as His children and remains committed to us despite our unfaithfulness. What amazing love, grace, and mercy that our God would call us and marry us and remain committed to us despite the fact that we commit spiritual adultery on a regular basis. And this love and grace should motivate us to want to live for Him, to repent of our sin when we do go wayward, and to remain connected in a vital, abiding, as Terry preached last week, relationship. Titus 2 says the grace of God has appeared. And it instructs us to deny ungodliness and to live a holy life. Grace motivates obedience. <laughs> love motivates intimacy. Who you are should be that which drives your behavior as a follower of Christ. Don't get the cart before the horse. Finally, number five, and we will go quickly here because I really preached this two weeks ago, eternal perspective. We are aliens and strangers, which means we're uncomfortable. <laughs> do, we have, um, do we have an international... I want, where's Ann? Ann from Vietnam? Where's Ann? You're so little, I didn't see you. <laughs> I love Ann. She's in my one-on-one -on -one class. So we did not rehearse this. Um, as an international student, give some words to describe what it's like to come to a country that's not your own and to have to live here. So I think that there's a little bit of fear because you know no one. Mm. And... It's very uncomfortable because everything is new to you and, and yeah, yeah, just uh, the feeling of not belong to, the, to mm. the place. Good. What has helped you get more comfortable and acclimated? What are some things that help you as an international, even though you're still in a foreign country, mm -hmm. you know, maybe adjust and, and make it here pretty mm -hmm. well? So uh, I think that God, God is with, with me. And uh, when I came here, I found a lot of brothers and sisters mm. in God, Ooh. the body of Christ, and it's helped me a lot. That was totally unrehearsed. But she said exactly what I wanted you to hear. Because there's a couple things going on, and then we're going to wrap it up and go, on, go into a time of extended worship. Bible makes it very clear. This is a quote from Leviticus 23. I believe you can check it out on your own. This is not our home. We are aliens, strangers, sojourners, exiles. We're not talking space creature. Those of you under 30, <laughs> aliens, you know, we think of space creature or something. 
It's someone who's living in a, in a land that's not their true home. Anne is in a foreign country. She's an alien. We actually we use the word illegal aliens. I mean, that's big in the news today, isn't it? We won't go there. But, you know, that's, that's using that word. It's someone residing in a place not their true home. And what helps, <laughs> you do well when even... You sh- it is uncomfortable. It should be uncomfortable. Here's the deal. If, if living here is not uncomfortable in, in some sense of the word, then we might be making this place too much our home. Come on. That'll preach. If you're really comfortable here, then it might mean you're making earth too much your home. And so if you cringe at sin, and if it almost depresses you at time, all the people that are wayward and far from God, and, and, the, and the accomplishment of the Great Commission isn't happening to the degree that you know God wants to, if that troubles you, good. We're supposed to be a bit uncomfortable. And here's the tension in the sanctification journey. Yes, we're to have joy. Yes, we're to have victory. Yes, we're to shout hallelujah. Yes, God wants His people to experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. At the same time, there's this tension because there's the passions of the flesh which wage war against the soul. And then there's this stuff that you see around you in the world that is far from God in which the Bible says the God of this world is in control of us. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Satan. And so there's all that going on and you're uncomfortable. And, 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 and that's part of sanctification. So I'm not going to make it any easier. I'm not going to try to sugarcoat this. That's just part of the journey that you've got to enter into. But here's the deal, and here's the big point. We are foreigners on earth because heaven is our true home. <laughs> and so just as we looked at two weeks ago, eternal perspective, there's a sense in which it's good to just long for the coming of Jesus. And long for heaven. And long for being reunited with people that have died that you love that were in Christ. And you meditate on Revelation 20 and 21, the new heaven and the new earth. That's our true home. Final verse, Hebrews 11. Worship team, get ready. That doesn't mean come up. I just meant in your spirit. (laughs) Hebrews 11. Look at this. This gets it. This is the chapter on faith. And all that we've talked about today requires faith to walk out, believing it, re-speaking it to yourself so it gets in your heart. Speak truth to yourself. Take that bookmark I gave you today and take those verses and speak them out to yourself until they trickle from your mind to your spirit. I'll tell you right now, if you do that, your life will be changed. Where's Lisa Fish? Lisa. What did you say in, in the 101 class this morning? Because it was awesome what you said, if you're willing. I said that I put my name in place of I, and eventually I believed it. Mm. But when somebody first gave you that little sheet, who we are in Christ? She wrote my name in each verse. Wow. But at first you were like... No, this isn't for real. (laughs) And since you've done that, how's it impacted you? It's for real. (laughs) Good word. All right, so Hebrews 11, it's the chapter on faith. And it, and it gives these great people, it gives these people, they're not great people in the sense, a lot of them have big time failures. But they walk by faith. And so in Hebrews 11, verse 13, look at this. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised. They didn't get all the things that, that had been promised because many of those things were for us. But having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, For people who speak thus make it clear that they're seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return, go back to Egypt, so to speak. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Amen? Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He's prepared for them a city. Beloved, in Christ, this is is not your true home. Heaven is our home. And it's eternal. 
And it's going to be full of God's people. We're going to see Jesus face to face. If you're here today and you've not received Christ, why would you not? What on earth could be something so good or important to keep you from repenting of your sin and receiving Jesus as Savior and Lord? Will you do that today? Will you say, I repent of my sin. I place my faith and trust in Christ alone. I'm going to believe God's Word. And I'm going to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of His beloved Son. I'm going to go from being dead in my spirit to being alive in my spirit. I'm going to go from being a sinner to being a saint. I'm going to go from being a child of darkness to being a child of the living God. Why would you not do that today? Eternity is in the balance. Right now. Right now. Eternity is in the balance. The decision you make right now, whether to receive or reject Jesus, will determine, based upon the Word of God, whether you spend eternity with God in heaven or not. That's true. I'm not trying to put pressure on anybody. I'm just speaking the truth in love. If you're in Christ today, these are truths about who you are. Let's review. You're a chosen race. That means you're wanted by the living God. You're a royal priesthood. That means you are welcomed into His presence. You are a holy nation. That means you're clean, you're forgiven, you're pure. You are a people of God accepted based nothing of which on your behavior, but all on who God is. And you're an alien and a stranger. You're uncomfortable. In the 1930s, there was a man by the name of Mr. Yates who lived in Texas. And he lived in virtual poverty. He, though he had a lot of land, he was basically living hand to mouth. And a seismographic oil company crew came knocking at his door one day and they said, Mr. Yates, we have reason to believe that there could be oil on your land. Could we drill with your permission? And if we hit oil, you get half, we get half. He had nothing to lose. He said yes. They drilled down and hit an oil well that to my knowledge is still one of the most active oil wells in the state of Texas. Overnight, that man went from being living in poverty, essentially, to being a multimillionaire. Listen carefully. The moment he bought that property, he acquired all the mineral rights to that place. But he didn't know what he had. Many believers today are so ignorant of who they are in Christ and what they have in Christ Thus they are living in spiritual poverty when so much more awaits them. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank You for who You are. I thank You for being a holy, sovereign, eternal, gracious, giving, loving Father. And I thank You for these amazing truths. And I ask You to make them real to Your people. And I ask You, God, to grant the gift of faith and repentance to any who are here who are not in Christ. God, I pray that now as we worship You, there will be an amazing spirit of joy, an amazing spirit of freedom, an amazing spirit of transparency, that there will be repentance, that there will be repentance. We often think repentance, repenting of sin, acts of immorality, and that's definitely a part of it. But many of us today, we need to repent of not believing what you say about us. And of basing our acceptance on our behavior instead of on grace. And so God, I pray that all that would be happening. Your Spirit would just be mighty to move. And that uh, now that we've heard your word, we'd apply it. That you would give grace for it to be applied. So have your way. And just still.